Welcome to tonight's show. This is the Big Game Hunting Series brought to you by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm your host, Nate Zielinski. Uh, as these cameras get spooled up, we're excited to have a great evening with you. We put together this entire content series to, to really help out hunters. And when we say hunters, everyone. Whether you are just now taking the Hunter's Ed course for, to somebody who's hunted for 20, 30 years, we're going to walk you through hunting big game in Colorado, walk you through all the opportunities and really ways to increase your success. We're going to talk you know, tonight about licensing, talk about scouting and how you really should scout, maybe changes to your scouting. Uh, and we're going to talk about gear, methods of take and everything to it. So we encourage everybody to really follow along on this entire hunting series. If you follow along step by step, it's really going to cater and take you through everything. So again, now that our camera's live, let's do, do another welcome. Uh, again, if you're just joining, this is the Big Game Hunting Series presented by Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and I'm your host, Nate Zielinski. We put this together as an entire step-by-step -step process to where, as a hunter, you can now jump on here and say, okay, I've never done this before, or I've been unsuccessful, or I've always hunted with my, my grandpa or my dad, and I'm going out by myself. We're going to walk you through the steps, especially even by date of what you should be doing, what you need to be doing, and all the ways to make sure that you have a successful hunt. We keep saying this. Success does not necessarily just mean the, the harvest of an animal. Success is just getting out there and enjoying nature, sharing conservation, and enjoying all the opportunities that, that exist here in Colorado uh, as a hunter. So a lot of ways to do that, and we're going to walk you through that entire process. With that said, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to be here for about an hour tonight, but we want to make sure that we get to all your questions. Number one, this is an engagement show. So right now, if you have questions, now is your time to ask them. You can jump right there, write in the comments. Feel free to, to literally answer or ask the questions that you have uh, regarding this stuff. So I know some of us get shy when we do seminars and do in-person things, but right now, you have questions about the big game hunting process or anything, the application, what we're talking about tonight. Type your comments in. We would love to help you out. We'd love to make sure that we get you 100% dialed in so you can ask those questions right, as much as you would like tonight, and we will answer them right here on the spot. So again, right now, I just want to make that very clear. Feel free. Bring your questions. We would love to answer them. Now, tonight is a big night because one week from tonight, one week, next Tuesday, April 6th at 8 p.m., is the deadline for the primary draw of big game licensing right here in Colorado. We've been sending out updates and, and talking about this on all our social channels and everything that we do at Parks and Wildlife. Uh, but with that being said, mark your calendar. The deadline is one week away. So number one, the first question I have for all of you, have you applied? If you have not applied, why haven't you? What is stopping you from applying for that big game license? Do you have your hunter's safety, your hunter's ed? That's one thing that I want to start off talking about because in the past, we've always done in-person hunters ed class. Right now, as long as you are 11 years or older, you can take the hunters ed class online. So you can really jump online and get the entire hunters ed process uh, and take this course online. It is quick, it is easy, it is simple, and, and there's no excuses out there. It is, it's never been this simple uh, to get through Hunter's Ed and, and acquire that to get to where you can hunt uh, here in Colorado, especially hunt that big game. So there is still time. You can still do that. So again, right now, if you don't have Hunter's Ed, jump online, go to our website, sign up. It is all set up for you. We'll drop the link in these comments uh, for everybody that has questions about how to obtain that Hunter's Ed. But that's the number one thing. What else is stopping you? What other questions do you have? Comment right now. Or let me know what your questions are, and we'll get to that. Now, I'm going to jump to a couple questions. I have questions throughout the course of the week. We always say that we're listening to you, uh, and I promise you we are. So through some of the videos that we've shared and just all of the stuff that we're doing here, we have comments. So I'm going to answer some of those comments, then I'm going to jump to yours. So again, right now, comment those questions you have. We're going to jump on them. Number one, we have a lot of hunters asking about the fires that we had in Colorado uh, in the 2020 season. Obviously, it was a big fire year. We had lots of fires. We're working closely with the Forest Service and BLM and all of our, our natural resources out there to really come up with a plan. But there are some closures. So we just want to say that if you are planning on applying in, in your hunting area that recently had a burn, Check with those managing partners and those managing services right now to make sure that during hunting season or even through the scouting season, what's going to be open, what's going to be closed. Uh, a lot of the forest is going to be open, but a lot of times some of the access 
is what's going to be tougher. You know, some of the roads still have down trees on them, especially through the high winds of winter. You know, lose a lot of trees, uh, things like that. So we just, number one, we want to encourage you, take those steps. Right now, as you're getting ready to apply for a license uh, or have applied, check with those areas, especially if it's in that burn, and just make sure that all the access, the roads, the trails, make sure that you can get in there uh, to have that successful hunt this coming fall. So that's one of the biggest things. If you're in a burn area, just check on those things. Make sure they're open. Uh, a lot of things happen in the winter, so just want to make sure that you are good to go this coming fall. We also want to talk to those who have applied. So you've jumped online. You've applied for this license right here. As you've applied for that license, we always encourage you, the, the system is so easy now, you can go in, check your points, uh, you can check what you've done, but I also say check your receipt, because right now you can check that receipt and you can make sure that your hunt code is right. Make sure it's in the right unit, make sure it's for the right week uh, or the right season that you're planning on hunting, because if you have to make those changes, you need to do so now, because after the deadline, the deadline is the deadline. That is a hard number. So I encourage you, it's one of those things that we always you know, click submit, we pay, we apply, everything's done, but check that receipt. Just make sure that everything is right. So we encourage that. That's gonna eliminate a lot of hassles that might come up later. Now the other question that we had, and we had this question a lot, uh, when it comes to hunting as a group. So in Colorado, you can apply as a group. So basically all that does is it tries to ensure that if there's six or seven or however members uh, of, your, of your friend's family that you wanna hunt with, um, that you guys all obtain that same license so you can make sure that you can go together. With that being said, that license is going to be awarded by the lowest preference point of the group. Now, this is going to be kind of confusing because I know so many groups that we talk to, um, you know, majority of the group will have maybe one preference point or two preference points, and they'll have one member of the group that has six. And oftentimes they're like, we're a shoo We're going to get the group uh, license because one person, you know, Uncle Fred, has, has six points. Um, and it's not the case. It's always going to go by the lowest preference point holder in that group to obtain that license. So just keep that in mind. Even though you have somebody with high points, is not going to ensure that you get that tag. So keep those major questions in mind. Now I want to jump to you guys. What questions do we have? I know, again, right now, comment your questions. Sometimes we get done with these fees and I was like, and, you know, you can turn it off and I'm just asking my questions. We're here. We're here for you. So ask those questions. But what questions do we have? I've got one. Could you talk about preference points for sheep, goat, and moose, how the draw works and time frames for some of those draws? Absolutely. So, so the biggest thing that, you know, as far as time frame, you know, we have our primary draw, which is right now. Then we now have a secondary draw, but when it comes to the moose, the goat, the sheep, uh, those type things, that is going to be a weighted point. So in regards to that, so your, so your moose, goat, sheep, you're going to put in, and that's going to be a weighted point. So essentially, you're going to put in for three years, and then the, the point kind of goes through a process. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. This could be an hour-long seminar as I walk you through how the weighted point works. Uh, but in reality, it, it's going to basically go through a, a mathematical process. The more years you have in the draw, uh, the, the better odds you have of obtaining that license. And that's what we call the weighted draw. We also have the traditional draw. Your traditional draw is going to be for your deer, your elk, um, your bear, and your pronghorn. And that's basically going to be stacked up. So the, the highest points that apply for that license, uh, it goes to those holders first and then tapers down. So, for example, uh, if, if the, you're applying for a pronghorn tag and it takes two points on average, you get it. So it's going to go by how many people put in for that license versus the quarter of how many licenses they issue. Uh, and then that basically is going to determine, you know, how many points it takes to obtain that tag. If somebody puts in with 20 points, obviously there are the preference in that, and then it tapers down from there. Uh, but the biggest thing you know, moose, goat, sheep is what we consider a weighted point. And the others, your, your deer, elk, pronghorn, bear, are considered a, a traditional point. Um, and again, we can kind of walk you through more of those, those facts, but that's how that works. Long story short, I, I definitely would apply. Now, the biggest difference in the application, when you apply for the traditional point, your elk, deer, pronghorn, and bear, um, when you select that and you apply for that first choice, you can then select. Um, you know, do I want an over-the-counter tag? Or do I want another tag if unsuccessful? And you can also, uh, upon being unsuccessful for that tag, on your first choice, you will receive a preference point. Um, you don't have to purchase that preference point, as opposed to in regards to the sheep, goat, and moose, 
Um, if unsuccessful with that tag, it is a $50 charge um, to basically to get that preference point for those species. So again, there is a difference and we can walk you through a, an hour long seminar um, on this. But the, those big three are weighted points. The others are traditional. Hopefully that helps. Uh, and then keep asking your questions. We, we highly encourage that. Ask your questions. So what else we have? Um, what's the legal size to harvest a bull in Colorado? To harvest a bull in Colorado. So this is going to be broken down by GMU or game management unit. So depending on, on where you're hunting, you're going to have a different scenario. But like uh, basically what we would consider an over-the-counter tag, OTC. Um, basically these type units, a bull is going to have to have four points on one side or a five-inch brow time. So we call them an eye guard. So that very first point, you're looking for that to be five inches or longer or four points on one side to make that illegal bull. Uh, but in some of your very limited areas, there's not going to be a point restriction where situations of even a spike or a younger bull uh, would be a legal harvest. So it depends on the GMU. So it's not a statewide scenario. Uh, so again, you can jump right here, scroll right to the elk page, and there's going to be a map that's going to walk you through uh, what those are, if there are point restrictions and what those point restrictions are, but it's either going to have a point restriction in which will be four points on one side or a five inch brow time, uh, or it will not have a point restriction uh, as far as the antlers go. But again, all that right here, we encourage everybody if you have those type questions, grab this book. You can go to any licensed agent or a state park to grab one of these books. So anywhere that is selling uh, fishing or hunting license, a small game license, anybody that's selling those licenses, any licensed agent, We'll have these books on hand. You can also go to our website and request a book, or you can go to a state park. I honestly, I read this almost through and through every year. There is a section that says new for the year, so I'll say new for 2021. That's a must read because things do change. Uh, but if you have not read this through, I encourage you, read this through. It's a great piece of information, and obviously the, the more we know, uh, the more conservation comes to play, and just the better outdoorsmen and hunter we are. So kind of keep that in mind. But that book right there has a lot of the, the questions uh, and answers that you're going to be looking for. So... We got any other questions here? Yeah, does harvesting a larger bull hurt the elk herd? So we're talking about the, the mature levels of the elk herd. Uh, you can look at this in a lot of different fashions, but in reality, no. The, the population of elk in Colorado uh, is second to none. Our elk herds are in very good shape. Uh, in Colorado resides the White River National Forest Herd, which is the largest elk herd in the continental U.S. I mean, it's the biggest elk herd in the world. Uh, so, so our elk populations are good. Um, honestly, a bull elk reads a, a breedable state to where they are a mature bull uh, that can go through the process of the breeding stages at a very young age. I mean, basically a three and a half year old bull is mature enough to, to run that process, even younger in some cases. Uh, so in regards to that, by harvesting a more mature bull, uh, you're really not doing anything as far as the overall management of the herds. You're not hurting anything by harvesting those more mature bulls. Uh, and honestly, in, in reality, you can kind of look at it a lot of different ways. By, by harvesting a, a more mature, older bull, number one, your, your take of meat will be better um, in regards to, to the quantity uh, of that meat. So a more mature bull will be a bigger body bull Therefore, your overall, you know, meat gain, uh, you know, basically, you know, out from the field to the table will be larger. Uh, you're also leaving room for more younger bulls to come into that play. You also have the other aspect to where a younger bull uh, maybe doesn't have, to have as much adrenaline running through. But maybe that's a, a, a fair that you're like, I want a smaller bull. Uh, you know, I don't want that maturity level. So, honestly, across the board, uh, you're not hurting, damaging, helping the, the population on either aspect whether you're pursuing a, a younger animal or, or the most mature animal in that herd. Uh, again, our populations are very good. And in regards to that ever coming up, uh, everybody here at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we're out there, the biologists, they're looking at these herd counts. They will adjust it as we need. Uh, so again, you see those areas that, that don't have a, a point restriction. Those are the type of areas where that herd population is good and they encourage and even make it an option uh, for those smaller bulls because that, that herd management in that area can handle that. So again, our folks at Colorado Pikes and Wildlife, they are adjusting those numbers uh, very commonly and frequently. So they will definitely adjust those numbers before it's ever a situation where us, the hunters, kind of have to keep that in place. So thank you for that way. So what else we got here? 
Does the website have maps or information showing where herds are active or activities are occurring within each unit? Absolutely. So, so we're going to have basically a, a variety of maps. They're honestly online. You have maps for everything. So they have maps showing where uh, basically what we consider summer herds. So those are going to be maps outlining where the summer herds uh, of deer, elk, those populations would live. We have heard uh, a map showing where they would be in migrations, where they would be in their wintering grounds. Uh, so we have maps on all that kind of stuff. Uh, guys, we got a big team behind the camera right here. I'm gonna see if I can get them to drop the links to some of those maps. But on the website is maps for all of that type stuff. And again, I mean, just talking maps, and we talked just in this book in general, uh, you know, great maps are showing what tags are available for what, antler list versus antler, uh, over the counter versus limited draw, uh, things like that. But online, there are some great things. We're actually gonna talk about that in our digital scouting here uh, in just a second, as far as other tools that you can do, as far as online resources for, for how to find areas and find those herd counts. So, let's do one more question, then we're gonna jump into some scouting. Can you share some thoughts and ideas on questions you might ask some of the public facing employees of CPW, like biologists or game wardens or some of the front desk help to help you um, get a, get along in your hunt? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the biggest thing I would say, you know, going forth to a hunt, knowledge is everything. So the, the most knowledge as a hunter that we can have uh, is better off. So knowing the rules, knowing the regs. When I, I talked to a, a wildlife officer last year, you know, and I'm asking like, hey, you know, on your toughest job, like, you know, what are you dealing with on, on a day to day? And he said, it's not the tough things that, that become an issue. It's the simple things. Validating your license. So like on a big game license, you have places for two signatures. The very bottom one is actually your harvest tag, where once you harvest an animal, you're going to place that carcass tag on that animal. But above that, you actually have to sign that license to validate it, to make it a legal license. So many people miss that. So they're out there, they have the license in the pocket, but it hasn't been basically you know, validated. So that's an issue. Evidence of sex, upon kill, you have to leave evidence of sex on that animal. That's one of those things that people get excited. You know, say you have an elk down, you're way back country, you know, everybody quarters it up to get it out of there and they forget attaching evidence of sex. And that's a type issue. So number one in that relationship, having knowledge of all those things. And honestly, in this book, not trying to beat you, beat you on the head with it, but in this book, there's actually a section talking about the most common, you know, issues in the woods, the most common violations, the little things. Uh, I actually read it earlier today. And I was like, I didn't even think about that. You know, it's one of those things that I naturally do because I've, I've hunted so much, but as a new hunter, things you might miss. So, so having that knowledge is everything. And talking about the, the resource, they, we, they do have an absolutely huge team. So Colorado Parks and Wildlife is a great team. You can call your region, uh, you can call the main number, and you can get those questions asked. And if you have very specific questions, um, everybody is available to talk. I mean, everything from the managers out in the field all, all the way down to the biologists. Everybody is public, available to talk to. Um, I will say that everybody is is pretty crazy busy. Everybody runs a pretty tight schedule. Uh, even though it might not be hunting season, wildlife management is always going. There's no breaks in it. So so our biologists are constantly out in the field. Uh, so give everybody a little bit of time to get back with you, get your answers. But everybody is available. So if we don't answer the questions. If you can't find the questions on, or your answers online, uh, give us a call, shoot us an email. We would love to, to help you out and address those questions in, in that manner. So now we're going to take questions all night. So I promise you, I'm not trying to jump away from it. Our main thing we want to talk about was licensing right there. Again, one week from tonight, April 6, 8 p.m. I will say, clue in on that, 8 p.m. In the past, you had until midnight. So, so years ago, you could apply until the draw date deadline, and you could apply till midnight. That is no longer the case. It is 8 p.m. I can't tell you how many phone calls I got last year. But it's like, you know, my phone's blown up at 9 o'clock. Like, hey, I can't apply for a license. What's wrong? Uh, again, it is 8 p.m. So April 6, 8 p.m., draw deadline for the primary draw. Make sure you get that in. What's stopping you? Again, we'll take some more questions later, but make sure you apply. Now. This is the big game hunting series. Now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts. Uh, the biggest thing that you've heard us talk about is the 60-40 rule. You, if you haven't heard that, you just joined us tonight for the first time. We always talk about the 60-40 rule. The more you scout, the more education you have, the more questions you have answered, the more successful you will be. And again, success can be you know delivered and thought of in so many different ways. You know, success can be just from coming at, coming out of the woods and having a very safe. Uh, outing, you know, just taking in what nature has to provide. It can be all the way down to a successful harvest. So again, success can be achieved in so many different ways. But with that, 
Scouting will help in all manners, knowing everything about the resource. So we're going to walk you through a quick calendar of what you need to have in mind with scouting. Now, as we proceed through basically the months here, we're going to break each one of these down even more. So we're going to talk about digital scouting, in-person scouting, long-range scouting, and all the little details that come with that. Right now is an overview because I want you to mark your calendar. Grab your phone, grab a paper calendar, grab a notepad. But right now, mark these things down because as you sit down right now and you look at your summer, your spring, you look at your vacations, you look at your time off work, I want you to think about these dates. And I want you to pick some days. Again, 60-40. 60% of your time spent scouting and 40% hunting is a ratio that oftentimes leads to a very successful hunt this coming fall. So keep that in mind, 60-40. You spend 60% of your available time scouting, 40% hunting. That's just a ratio that I promise you is going to help you out this coming fall. So with that, first things first, we always talk about April. We're just a week away or a couple days away, I should say. In April and basically that kind of early May, this is your time what we call digital scouting. I spend so much time on a digital platform, on my phone, on a computer, on a tablet or a, you know, some sort of iPad. Uh, now is your time to learn about the resource before you can actually get out there before, you know, where there's still so, so much snow and the, the animal migrations aren't there. Now is your time to learn everything about the resource. And I use that word resource because I want you to think about everything. So through a digital platform, this can be everything from all the maps that we have available online right here. And, and again, as Color Punch Wildlife, they pump out a lot of information on that. We'll drop some links in these comments. Um, of what's available as far as on those digital platforms. But right here, Colorado Parks Life has a ton of information to help you with the digital process. We also have things like Onyx Maps and three or four other various you know, software platforms that are very easy to use, very user-friendly. Uh, they're going to help you scout. And one of my favorites, the use of Google Earth. Now, Google Earth isn't going to necessarily show you your public-private lines. It might not show you which trails are open and closed. But Google Earth is nice because it's free. You can download it right now. There's no cost. It's not hard. Just look up Google Earth and you can start getting a lay of the land. And that's what it is right now. Right now, it's all about just the general idea. So I know I tell people right now, hey, you know, we're starting digitally for almost a whole month. All of April, early May. This is our digital process. Everybody's like, man, I can look through a map in 10 minutes on the digital side and I'm good. Why don't I need a month? I want you to know everything. This is your homework. This is something you're studying. Picture this. Let's fast forward to September, October, and we're out in the woods. Let's say we're hunting elk, and all of a sudden we're, 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 you know, we're pursuing a, a herd or a particular bull, and that bull goes over the hill. When that bull goes over the hill, I don't want you to have to take out your phone and look at a map. I don't want you to have to hike up that hill to see what's on the other side. When that bull goes over that herd, I want you to know in your head, hey, through scouting through all of April, I memorized this terrain. I know on the back side there, there's a big patch of dark timber where those animals are going to go bed. So I know I'm going to leave them. I'm going to let them go bed, let them relax, and they're going to come right back out tonight. Or you can say, hey, I know from digital scouting, that's just another big wide open valley. I know if I get to the top of that hill, I'll be able to take the shot. So again, the digital process is all about embedding that knowledge of the lay of the land. So digital scouting. Number one, I'm going to walk you through the list right now. Make a copy, take notes, take a screenshot, whatever you want to do, but make some notes of this digital scouting. Number one, I want to learn all of my access. So I want to know all the roads leading into that area I'm going to hunt. So I'm applying for a license. Again, we talked about this. Through this book right here, we should have a good idea of how many preference points it takes. We should know what license we're going to obtain. We don't want surprises. You know, don't have one preference point and apply for a license that has, you know, 20 points to draw and just hope you're going to get it. Uh, we should have a good idea of what we're going to draw. So right now in scouting, we have a good idea of what we're going to draw. We have a backup plan of what we're going to hunt. So I'm scouting that. So number one, the trails, roads, access. How am I going to go in and out of these hunting grounds, of this game management unit? So when I go up to my hunting grounds, where can I go? Where can a truck go? Where are there trails? Is a trail open to motorized vehicles like ATVs or, or dirt bikes? Um, what is foot traffic only? I want to know everything, and that's the biggest thing. How many of you, and honestly, right now, I'll, I'll tell you, I want you to give, give me thumbs up when I say this. So how many of you have parked the truck? It's like 2 a.m., right? You hike way in that mountain for three hours. When you're sitting there, the sun's just coming up, and you're thinking to yourself, 
I'm the only human that has ever been here. And you're excited. All of a sudden, the sun comes up, and there's a person over here and a person over there. And all of a sudden, an ATV comes up the bottom, and you're just, like, deflated. You're like, how did that happen? It happens because a lot of times we didn't quite do our scouting. I'm not being mean, but I, I'm just saying, if you do enough scouting, you know where the access is. You know where people have to park. You know where they have to come in from. So all of a sudden, you can study that and say, hey, you know, I know when I'm hunting this close to this trail and where you can take an ATV and a truck you can assume there's going to be some more hunters. So give me a thumbs up if you've been that person. I know you have. So I, I, everybody has had that situation where you're like, man, it's crazy. Um, so digital scouting. Learn every trail, every access point. I really take notes. I'll take a screenshot of Google Earth on my phone, or I'll, I'll use, again, one of the maps, like Onyx, or one of these that I can write on. But I'm going to make notes of where every trail is. So again, right now, April, digital every access point that you possibly have. That's one of the biggest things that I'm studying. Number two, I want to know the public versus the private. I want to know what private ground there is, what public ground there is. This is for a lot of reasons. Number one, obviously we never want to get in trouble. We don't want to push our, our boundaries. I think so many hunters, I don't want to say it's old school, but we rely on fences. How many of us just assume that every inch of private ground in Colorado has a fence on it? A lot of us assume we do, but it's not the case. And a lot of times, even these fences that were built 70, 100 years ago might not be right. It's your obligation as a hunter to know the public versus the private. You need to know where that private land is. Now is the time to do that. Don't be out in the woods, you know, with limited service on your phone, looking at a paper map, being like, I think we're on public. Now is the time to do it. You have time to look things up. You have great service. You have great, you know, opportunities on computers. Know the public and private to where, number one, we don't get in trouble, we don't push those boundaries. Number two, I want to know where these animals can go. So all of a sudden, we've all been in that situation where you have a big ranch, big private ground, maybe they don't allow hunting. And all of a sudden, you start getting animals that are kind of associated to that. Um, and as hunters, you know, pursue these animals, they kind of go there for, for you know, kind of that, that, that safety zone. This can always lead to a frustrating time as a hunter here in Colorado. It's just the case. So I want to know those areas to where during hunting season, all of a sudden I'm like, man, I scouted, I had this great plan, and, and the elk just disappeared on this big private ranch, and now I can't hunt them. So know those private public grounds. So you know to say, hey, I'm okay if they go on that property. It's not a big deal. Or, hey, I know that that's going to be frustrating. Let's avoid that. So keep those things in mind. So digital scouting. You're learning the trails, the access. You're also learning the public versus the private. You can even take it one step further and, and know if that private ground, if they hunt it or they don't hunt it. That's going to give you a lot of answers that will be very helpful this coming fall. So again, you're scouting that. Now lastly, and most importantly, as we scout, we're always looking for what we call the daily migrations. The daily migrations are going to be the three things that are going to help you create a successful harvest more than anything else you can do. Scouting the daily migrations. What are those migrations? These animals are going to go back and forth. Now this is everything. Elk, deer, pronghorn, bear, sheep, goat, moose. Any big game that you hunt in Colorado is going to have these migrations. And almost all of them are going to have these migrations daily. That is food, water, and bedding. All of these animals are going to drink almost every day. If not, maybe it's every two days, and sometimes it might be five times a day. But they're always going to drink. They're always going to go to a bedding ground. They're always going to go to an area to, to, to relax, calm down, recuperate, bed, uh, things of that nature. We're also always going to have food. Obviously, they have to eat. Sometimes these might be in a very narrow corridor. So sometimes they might be able to get food, water, and bedding in a 10-acre patch. Sometimes we see these animals migrate as far as three, four, five miles uh, to obtain water or food or bedding. But regardless, I promise your animals are going to go through those migrations. Studying the, those areas that are going to present those opportunities is the way that you're going to create success. Again, how we you know associate that to success. Number one, you're going to say, okay, hey, I know they have to go here to drink. Maybe I'm that hunter that wants to sit on a water hole. Awesome. You, if you study where all the water is, where all your water sources, creeks, wallows, little ponds, um, you know where those animals are going to be and you can learn that pattern. You can hunt them in that situation or you can at least know the timing of when they're coming and going. Things like their bedding grounds. To me, I love knowing their bedding grounds because I want to know that once they're in their bedding ground, I leave them be. 
I'm not that hunter that tends to pursue them in their in their bedding grounds. Let them go in their bedding grounds, let them relax, and they're going to come out in a very normal pattern, allowing you to hunt them uh, on another hunt, another day, whatever that case may be. So it's a priority for me to know, know and learn those bedding grounds. Then I also put a major focus uh, on learning where they're feeding. Now this can be kind of wide open. Sometimes it's a big deal, sometimes it's not. If you have a really green, you know, moist year, you'll have grass everywhere, and that food source is available all over the place. But there's other years, so maybe you're in a drought, maybe it's dry, um, and all of a sudden that food source will be limited, and you really have to know where that is at. So again, through digital scouting, you're really looking at your device, looking at Google Earth and all these mapping, and you're trying to say, hey, where are their creeks? Where are their aspens that I know are associated with water? So I'm going to find the walls, I'm going to find the ponds, I'm going to find the creeks. And I'm going to find all the bedding grounds, excuse me, <clears throat> in that area. I'm going to look for all the dark timber. It's easy on the map. You can find those big shadowed areas. Where is those big patches of dark timber? Where is the open areas that are going to have grass? <clears throat> You're trying to learn where those are. Your daily migrations, food, water, bedding. You learn those. And instantly, number one, you're going to find good signs of life. You're going to find your animals. You're going to find patterns. You're going to find timing. And all of those combined are going to allow you the opportunity to pursue and hunt these animals. Again, we're going to walk you through that process. But number one, April and early May, right now, you have four, five, six weeks to scout this. Digital scouting, now is your time. So next time we come back, I'm going to ask you how you've been. Have you found these areas? I'm going to show you some of my maps. And I want to make sure that you have done this. You've walked through the process. Hey, hey, I found the food. I found the water. I found the bedding. So between now and early May, digital scouting, learn all the resource. Now, as we get into May, I'm going to kind of double check what I saw. So when May rolls around, uh, so this is all of May, early June, I'm actually going to start driving out. So I jump my vehicle. I'm going to drive out to that GMU, go to the area that I'm hunting, I'm not going to really hike around a lot, but I'm going to look through binoculars, look through a spotting scope, and I'm just going to make sure that what I see on the digital version is true in real life. So again, when I'm scouting these maps and it says that this trail is open, I want to drive up and I want to physically see, are all these roads open or are they closed? Do they have temporary closures, things like that? I want to look at these roads and say, hey, is my vehicle passable? Can I make it up these roads? You know, I'll look at the terrain. Hey, I was planning on hiking up this trail. Am I physical enough to hike up that trail? So we're going to put all that in mind. So May uh, is a little bit shorter time frame, but really May is all about checking what that, that entire digital process was. Just making sure that what I thought was, was there, what I thought was, was something, double checking to make sure that it was. Now in May, I honestly, I'm not that, uh, that focused on the animals. And this is one of the hardest things that I think people struggle with. Is when I talk about scouting, <clears throat> everybody just wants to find animal, 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 animal. April's digital. May. I'm just double checking what I saw on the digital side is true. I, and honestly, in May, I don't even look for an animal. I don't have to be there early in the morning, late at night. I'm not putting my binoculars and spotting scope up on the hill. I'm not focused on the animals. I'm looks, looking. Hey, that definitely was water in that drainage. I just checked it. It is water. Hey, I thought this hillside was dark timber. It is dark timber. May, you're checking up on the digital scouting process. Now as we get into June, now is when it's time to put boots on the ground. When I hit June, now I'm actually going to go out there. I'm going to hike around. I'm going to hike into that far drainage. And again, I know the digital process. I know what's there. But now I'm going to start looking things over. One of the big things that I do in June is I carry my GPS. I say, okay. If I'm going to hunt this back drainage, how long does it take me to get there? So come hunting season, I know, hey, I know exactly it takes me one hour to hike to this drainage. Or, hey, I know it takes four hours. I'm going to have to hike in the night before. So in June, I'm actually putting boots on the ground. I'm hiking around. I'm knowing the terrain. I'm checking all those digital areas again if I have to hike into them. I'm doing that in June. And now I'm also starting to focus on animals. Generally speaking, we wait until the young of the year is born, and that's what starts your summer and fall patterns. So in May, when the elk haven't dropped their calves, when the deer haven't dropped their fawns, when none of the young of the year is out yet, these animals are still moving around. Once they, they basically have birth, which is going to come in June, 
that's when all of a sudden these animals are going to strike their summer patterns. That's when you can kind of start hiking around. Um, and again, we always encourage to make sure that you always are, are in the right spot. Some areas have closures during the elk process season. So make sure that during a cabin season, if that area is closed, you know that on the map, but you'll know that through the digital scouting process. But again, biggest thing, in June, you're now hiking around. You're now watching animals. You're starting to put some focus on that. As we move into July, now you are starting to pattern the animals. Now, the biggest thing that I do in July and, and August that is different than June, June, I'm hiking around. June, I'm out looking for these animals. I'm on every ridge top with my binoculars staring at the animals. I'm with my spotting scope looking at them. As I start to get into later July, I start to get into August, I actually back up. It's called long range scouting. Now, I, I'm the guy that I'm not going to encourage everybody that you have to have the best gear. This right here is a spotting scope. A lot of hunters will know what this is. If you're a new hunter, this is basically an optic device that allows me to look at a very far, great distance. The reason I love this is because in July and August, I've now found the animals. I found the water. I found the food. I found the bed. I found so many of the, the key resources to produce patterns to where I know where the animals are at. They're, they're there. Every time I go in there, they're still there. I have a pattern. The last thing I want to do is scare them. I don't want to spook them. I don't want to interfere with them. So when I start getting into July and August, I'm using my spotting scope and I'm looking from afar. I might be a mile away from them watching them. They don't even know I'm there. So these animals have their normal patterns. And that's my goal. July, August is I'm trying to pattern them. I want to watch from afar. I want to make notes. I want to say, hey, you know, on an average sunny day, this herd is out in their feeding grounds until 8 a.m. At 8 a.m., they go into the dark timber. Or and, you know, in the afternoon, I don't see anything until 4 p.m. All of a sudden, at 4 p.m., they feed out into the grass. So I'm learning patterns. I'm watching how they move around naturally, when they bed, when they drink, when they eat. I'm watching all of these, and I'm doing it from afar so they never smell me. They never see me. They never hear me. I'm not pushing my animals around. Now that I'm building some information, I want to respect and really grasp that information. I want it to continue. So July, August is basically long range scouting and I'm watching that process. As we move forth into the fall, now we're starting getting into hunting season. So depending on what license you're obtaining, whether it's pronghorn that starts on the 15th or your elk and deer on the second or your rifle tags that proceed from that point on, my scouting continues, so whether I'm a rifle hunter or an archery hunter, I basically, from August on, I'm just staying out there scouting, long range, a little bit of boots on the ground, and I'm just keeping up with those animals. I'm adjusting the patterns. As the, the elk go into rut, I'm, I'm just, again, just adjusting those patterns of timing, where they're at, what they're doing, uh, and all those key little features. And that basically is the step-by-step the -step process of scouting. April's digital. May, you're driving, looking around, checking up on the digital. June, you're hiking around, getting all that information. July, August, looking from afar, building patterns, understanding behavior, and you just continue that process right through the hunting season. And that is the true, just absolute awesome way to create success. And I promise you, once you do this enough, you'll start to enjoy the scouting process just as much as the hunting process from seeing animals, being out there with them. Uh, it, it's also it, it's a true great experience. So that is basically the, the concept of scouting in a nutshell. As we go forward through the coming weeks and months, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to break this down even more. So we'll have very detailed you know concepts of this. I'm actually going to go out in the field during these times, and I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to go find elk, find deer, and walk you through exactly what you're looking for. So after I did all that big spiel, who's got questions about it? Who has questions about scouting? Again, I hope you took notes, but let's hear some questions. Would you adjust the timeline if you had a later season, like third or fourth season? You know, that's kind of what we talked about. I don't because very rarely do these animals ever move. Now, you might see a situation where an animal might move a mile, but if you know, hey, this big drainage I'm in has, you know, eight, ten different bulls in it, even through the, the archery or the muzzle or the first rifle hunts, obviously they get harvested, that's one thing, but... So many times these patterns repeat themselves. Uh, so it's one of those things that honestly, I scout the whole process. Even if I have a fourth rifle tag, I still do as much scouting in July, August as I do. All that information is still very valuable and kind of a, a little trick. Obviously, it, it's very area to area, but especially on the elk side. 
a an elk for the most part, especially a bull, how they summer is oftentimes how they winter. People don't realize this, but if you have a big bull that is very independent, so you see that big bull in July and he's by himself, more than likely late November, December, he'll be by himself. That bull is with a big harem. You know, so you have uh, a bull, and I shouldn't say harem, a group of bulls, a bachelor group. So you have 10 bulls in June, July together. That bull will hang with a larger group of bulls in his wintering pattern. So a lot of things do transfer. So absolutely still worth scouting throughout the course of summer, even if you have those later days. Have you seen, does hunting put pressure on or affect the migration patterns that you observed earlier on in the season? You, know, you, you will see a, a few things. And honestly, that's going to come, I don't want to say with the talent level of a hunter, but, but how you go into the woods. So let's just say a hunter that is very in tune to, to his hunting levels or he or her hunting level. So if you go out there and you watch your win, so you know when your wind's wrong, you're not proceeding forward. If your wind's wrong, you back out. When the animals go to bed, like we talked about earlier, when they go to bed, I back up. Um, and if you hunt them with that manner, you will have no effect on their daily patterns. Now, if you're that hunter that says, hey, I've waited 11 and a half months for this tag, even though they bedded down, we're going for it. Like, we're going to hunt them. I've, you know, I've waited all this time. I've spent all this money. Like, no way I'm going to back out at 8 a.m. in the morning. We're going to hunt all day. <clears throat> Sometimes pursuing them and putting extra pressure on them Definitely, that can change the pattern. I'm not saying you can't do it, uh, but you can't expect the patterns to change. So it really is going to come down to, to how you hunt. If you're that hunter that's not going to pursue when you should, you're really going to watch your wind, you're going to watch your movement, you're going to be very, very discreet when you're in the woods, you'll have no pattern change. If you're extremely aggressive, you will have some pattern change uh, in regards to that. So that's one of those things to keep in mind. You know, what kind of hunter and how you want to be. Do you have any recommendations about how far you should plan on hiking for scouting properly, both in miles and elevation? Absolutely. So, so how far to, to scout and things like that. This is one of those things that we're really going to cover, um, you know, here in one of our next couple of feeds here in about three, four weeks. But honestly, this is the, the biggest truth. You need to scout as hard as you're going to hunt. And that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions that, that happens in the hunting world is, Everybody considers their scouting process. They drive around in a truck, they look a little bit, they find a campsite, they glass and they call that scouting. But then when hunting season rolls around, you know, they're hiking 5, 10, 15 miles a day. I scout as hard as I hunt. So absolutely. And I kind of break down my hunting area kind of in almost, you can call them zones. Uh, you know, to where I say, okay, I have a trailhead right here. Here's where I'm parking my vehicle. You know, you have like zone one, <clears throat> maybe that's a, a two mile radius. And that's where everybody can go. Then maybe if that gets, you know, over pressure or you do have hunters that put too much pressure and they push the animals, you have like zone two. And maybe that's hiking out to, you know, three, four miles. Um, and you can continue that out. So when I'm looking at an area, I do plan that. And I kind of, you know, plan my hike and hunt accordingly. If you are physical enough and you're that person that says, hey, I don't want to see other hunters. I want to be away. You can definitely do that. But I would definitely, more than anything, I would say I scout as hard as I hunt. And I also try to push to how far I could go just so I have it in my head. So when I'm out there in May and June, uh, and I'm just trying, you know, more so June, I'm putting boots on the ground, I want to know, hey, on digital scouting, I see this big bowl way back in here. Can I access that? Is that too far? And more importantly, I'm going to follow the big game hunting strategies, and I know I'm going to be successful. So when I do harvest a bull back there, can I get it out? Is it something that is going to be achievable myself? So know those things, but I definitely, I, I scout extremely hard. I probably scout harder even than I hunt. Um, and I do have all those answers. I find those animals. So definitely I, I would put as much or even more emphasis on the scouting, even on the physical side, as much as I do as I plan on. How many trail cameras do you utilize in a specific area? So when it comes to trail cameras, that's one of those things that we're going to kind of bring into play as we kind of move forward. Uh, trail cameras are going to be one of those things that I start setting as early as June, but really set them in July. So when we talk about long-range scouting of July and August, like we just mentioned, my goal through long-range scouting is to watch from afar. I don't want to, to booger up the animals. I don't want to make them nervous. And that's where a trail camera can be very useful. Now, trail cameras can be used in a lot of ways. Now, I, I'm not going to make fun of anybody. I don't anybody take offense, but 
Oftentimes I see trail cameras where it turns into more of a bragging board. I see them floating around Facebook, floating around Instagram. It's like, look at this bull! You know, and they get so excited to show me this giant bull and, and you're, you're posting online. And <clears throat> I always tell them, I'm like, that's awesome. Show me the picture, you know, when you create that successful harvest. I'm like, well, I didn't do that. I got a picture of, you know, six months ago. Um, I use a trail camera more as a, a timer, more as a scouting device. It's a piece of, of, of equipment and a tool um, that's going to help you achieve success. So I don't necessarily even care if I have that beautiful picture of that big buck, bull, bear, pronghorn. I use it for a timing phase. So I want to know when they're going in and out of the migrations that we just talked about. When do they drink? That's a huge piece of information that you need to know. When do they go to their bedding grounds? Huge piece of information to know. When are they feeding? You want to know the timing of that. And that's where that trail camera is absolutely huge. If you know when they're going in and out of those areas, you know when to pursue. You know when to back off. Take this, for example. How many times have we been pursuing like an elk? It's bugling. You know, you're, you're out there in an archery or a muzzleloader situation. You first rifle when they're still bugling. And you're pursuing them. And all of a sudden, they start going you know, near dark timber. They're not in it yet, but they're going near it. I really can look at my watch and through trail cameras and scouting, you can say, hey, on average, that bull almost always beds down at 8.30 in the morning. You can look at your watch and say, man, it's 8.29. You know he's going to bed down before you have that opportunity, so you can make that educated decision to just back off. Step back, let him go to bed, let them do their thing. Or you can say, hey, it's 8.10. i got 20 minutes before he's in his bed. That's when he's always on my camera. I have time. Let's pursue it. So the camera is going to be a timing resource to help you obtain more information and make good decisions in the field. So again, food, water, bedding, most importantly, bedding and, uh, and the water source. That's where I put my trail cameras. So how many do I have out? 100% depends on the area. I have areas that I hunt right now that there's one water hole in a massive drainage. I have one camera. Put one camera on the water, maybe one on a trail going in and out of a bedding, <clears throat> and you have it covered. I have other areas where there might be 15 wallows in, in a big drainage on a hillside. There's 15 water holes. I'm looking for you know deer, elk, bear. You know as many cameras as I can put up on those areas to, to learn the pattern. So it's really not going to be a situation of you know six makes a difference. I put up as many. I mean obviously you have to have the resource. You have to buy the camera and things like that. Um, but it, as many as I need to try to obtain that information. Because again. Even though we're not in the woods, the camera is building that intel. Um, so timing is everything. I also, one little trick, um, I do use a trail camera to scout wind. Um, thermals is the biggest thing that is going to change your hunting scenario. And we're going to talk about this more. This isn't really for tonight. But we're going to talk about the flaws that hunters have. Uh, but wind is the biggest thing. There's not anything in the world, noise, physical ability, nothing has ever ruined more hunts. Uh, and the history of hunting than scent. Uh, having an animal smell you and having poor wind and poor scent ruins more hunts than anything else out there. So by scouting that, you can go out in the woods physically and you can use a, a wind checker. Um, you know, I mean, I carry one on everything I do. So you have your, your wind checker right here. So you go out there and you have a, you know, a little puffer to check your wind. You see which way your wind's going. Um, so that's like an option. Or you can check with your trail cameras. Now, all of you have, have a wind meter on your trail cameras, right? I love it. Right now, everybody is thinking to themselves, they're like, I don't think my trail camera does that. So all you have to do, take a ribbon. You can take, you know, marking ribbon. You can take yarn, um, any very light material. I've seen a lot of hunters that put feathers on a real light string, like fishing line. But in the, the angle that my camera's at, so my camera's pointing at this wall of hole, pointing at this trail. Hanging from a tree, I have a ribbon. I have some sort of very lightweight material that will sway even with the slightest breeze. So every time that I get a picture of an elk, a deer, a bear, I will always have my wind marker and it will always be pointed up or down or, or whatever it is. I try to set my camera in relationship to my wind meter to where when I snap a picture of an elk, I'll say, okay, the elk came in from right to left. So he came from the food to the water. He did that at 8.30 a.m. And I know at 8.30 a.m. my wind was sucking downhill. So my thermals were going downhill. So now by having a trail camera use as a tool, not as a bragging device, I now have everything. I know when I'm coming hunting, if that pattern repeats itself, I know that the bull is coming from here, you know, from point A to point B at a certain time. I know what my wind's doing. I know how to approach and I can create that success. So trail cameras, 
Honestly, at the end of the day, probably the more the merrier, but you had to put them in the key areas. Water, bedding, most importantly, and always throw that wind meter up there. Piece of yarn, feather, something hanging from a tree to where anytime you get a thermal, it will sway, and when you look at your pictures, you'll know what that wind was doing. So, does that answer the question? Hopefully. What else we got? Any suggestions on how to scout heavily wooded areas from a distance where glassing is harder? And, and that's always going to be the, the situation. We get this question, honestly, a lot. I'd say every hunting series we have, is, we run into hunters that are dealing with really dark timber. Um, and in regards to that, number one, you're, you're still going to have to have a food source. So in the, the head, heavily wooded areas, you know, you're still going to have to have some sort of open country where that green grass is. They're, they're not going to live their 100% of their life in the dark timber. Even if it's small valleys, small meadows, uh, there's going to have to be some open country to present that food source. So in those situations, a lot of times, whether it's high or low, I sit low looking up the big draw. I climb to the top of the mountain and look down. You're going to try to find whatever open country is because that's where the food's going to be. And you're going to start glassing it. Even if you don't feel like it's worthwhile because you're staring at a, a three-acre meadow and that's all you have to look at, you're still going to scout it. Now, I will say that I put more emphasis on cameras in those dark timber areas more so than I do the open country. Because, um, again, the camera can be there where you're not. So, you know, find the trails, find those key areas. But regardless, again, even though in your head it's all dark timber, there is going to be open country, and that's where those animals are going to feed because that's where the food is at. So find those key open areas where the food is and just, you know, really sway your emphasis to those type areas to, to help you out there. All right, Randy, one more question. We're going to jump on to methods of take. What altitude do you prefer to hunt elk at? So this is my favorite question. I'm glad. Uh, whoever answered that, uh, I can't see you on there, but great question. What elevation do I hunt elk at? We talked about this earlier. Now, I don't want to sway anybody that's already applied for the licensing, but in the perfect world, when I select a GMU for hunting elk, I try to select an area that has a lot of elevation change because then I can break down the season accordingly and go to where it's going to lead to the most optimal opportunity to hunt those animals. So if I have a, an, an area that has big tree line country, you know, 12, 13,000 feet, maybe it has low line country, 8,000 feet, I'll adjust it to the season. If all of a sudden it's a, a wet, cold, you know, damp type year, those animals will be down and I hunt them in the lower country. If it's an archery tag and it's a dry, hot year, those animals are going to be up the tree line, or at least those are the ones that are going to be running first. So I'll go hunt them up there. So it's not a perfect world. You can't say that I love this elevation, but picking an area that has multiple elevations in it is going to be the most optimal place to go because it gives you more availability to go to them. Um, when you really have a specific spot, you know, you're hunting the northwest corner and you're hunting lower elevation and you depend on snow to create a migration for you, when it happens, it's great. When it doesn't happen, it's a little tougher. So there, there's a lot to look at in regards to that. But ideally, if you're asking specifically what elevation, I would love one that has the most wide variety and uh, allowing me, the hunter, to select where I want to go. So I love to hunt areas that have a wide elevation change and it creates a lot of opportunity for me to uh, to hunt those animals. So hopefully that helps you out. Now, guys, again, we're going to keep jumping on here. We have a ton of stuff. Keep asking your questions. Uh, we're trying to keep the show a little shorter, so we're going to run through some other stuff here. But the next thing that we're going to talk about is methods of tape. Now, this is something that I absolutely love and cherish to talk about because when you walk the floors of a sportsman show or you jump to a retailer right now during hunting season and you ask somebody, you say, hey, Jim, you know, are you a hunter? He goes, yeah, I'm a hunter. I'm like, what kind of hunter are you? He says, I'm a rifle hunter. Then you ask, you know, the next guy, and you say, hey, you know, you know, Tom, you know, are you a hunter? He goes, yeah, I'm a bow hunter. And you say, hey, Sarah, are you a hunter? Yeah, I'm a muzzleloader. I'm an archery. Everybody is very specific to their style, and, and I appreciate that. Get good at things, and, and, and you create that success. But there's so many opportunities in Colorado with archery, muzzleloader, rifle, and everything takes uh, a different zone. So. Each game management unit, so where you're hunting, might be better during a specific week or a specific season. Um, and other things that we talk about, I can't tell you how many people that I talk to that look here, then they look here and they say, man, I hunt first rifle, but I can't draw the tag. It takes five points. And I'm like, oh, that's rough. So I look at their unit and I look at the points it took last year. I said, hey, as it takes five for first rifle, but third rifle, it doesn't take any. I'm like, oh, that's third rifle. Again, 
you have to think about the opportunity. So one, obviously it's enjoyable for you. So what you enjoy doing, whether it's archery, muzzle, or rifle, I encourage you to do it. But if you're that hunter right now, you're brand new, you've never hunted, or you're somebody that's looking to kind of start fresh, methods of take are going to present a lot of opportunity. So that's how I look at it. I look at strictly as opportunity and not so necessarily the, the device at which I'm hunting with. And that's one of those big things that you have to think about. So when I look at it, I can say, hey, you know, I can't take a, a block of work off. I can't take six days off from work. It's just not possible. I'm the person then that might look at an archer tag. I have, you know, a full month to hunt. So now all of a sudden I can say, hey, I can hunt two days here. I can wait a week and hunt two days. I can wait a week and hunt two days. And it leads to a lot of opportunity. Or you can say, hey, I don't have points. So I know that as a brand new hunter, I have not collected preference points in the past. I need to find an area or a method of take that leads to, to a hunt with less points. Sometimes that might be archery. Sometimes that might be a rifle tag. Um, but regardless, methods of take. Number one, I look at it as opportunity because in, so many of us get stuck in our ways uh, of only pursuing with one method of take during one week, and that's just what we do. By branching out, it's going to create a lot more opportunities for you. So keep that in mind because, uh, again, in regards to method of take, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, now as we break it down for methods of take, this is one of those things that we kind of wanted to talk about today because obviously methods of take, you have your rifle hunt, you have your muzzle loadering, uh, you also have your archery. Right now, we, we definitely saw a boost in outdoor recreation. With outdoor recreation, we saw a lot in the shooting sports. When I say shooting sports, same thing, archery, muzzle, and rifle. I would say that the sales of all of these products <clears throat> are higher than we've seen in a long time. In some cases, it's even hard to, to either find that method of take or find the, the projectiles that you need for that. So when I say that, sometimes finding your rifle can be tough right now. Finding optics for those rifles can be tough, and definitely finding ammunition can be tough. Same thing in muzzle muzzleloader world. We're seeing quite a few muzzleloader still, but bullets and powder have been very tough to come by. Same thing in archery. Archery, a lot of times the bullets are hard to come by, and then if so, arrows, broadheads, everything that goes with that. So in regards to method of take, number one, look at your opportunities. Number two, now is the time to, to decide what you're gonna do and make those purchases. We say this because every year comes July, and all of a sudden, the, the increase in hunting you know, retailers sees an increase. And everybody in July is like, I need ammo, I need a gun, I need a bow, I need a muzzleloader. That time is now. What used to happen in July is now happening in March and April. So by planning to, to archery hunt, obviously you need some time to, to learn to shoot a bow, to, to have the strength to draw a bow back, and everything that comes with that. Uh, so now is the time. You need to get that bow, get the arrows, dial it into where you can start shooting to where you're comfortable in an August or September time frame. If you're planning on a rifle hunt, obviously there's so much that goes into caliber selection of that firearm that you need to have those time to say, hey, you know, do I want a, a particular caliber? Do I want a certain style of gun? And once I determine what I want, can I buy that? And if the, a retailer around your area doesn't have it, you might need to order it. We're seeing order wait time sometimes of two, three, even four months, which I tell you is putting you absolutely on crunch time for this upcoming season. Same thing with ammunition. This is probably one of the biggest things that I'm seeing right now is somebody will have the particular caliber of choice and they're going to the, the local retailer and they say, ah, you know, I have a 300 Win Mag. I've always shot, you know, a, a Hornady 200 grain bolt. And that's what I shoot. They go to the retailer and now they only have a different brand and a different weight. Instead of being forced to change what you know shoots good, now is the time where you can say, hey, I realize that I'm not going to get that ammo. Let's order it. Let's make sure that I put orders in. Let's do some research. Find where I can get that to where I have the best success opportunity coming fall. Because again, not every bullet shoots the same through every rifle. Not every arrow shoots the same through every bow. Everything is different. So now is the time that gear is an absolute must. So make sure you keep that in mind as absolutely a priority. And also make sure that the, the firearm, the muzzleloader, the archery equipment that you're using matches legal, basically, opportunity here in Colorado. I think so many times I, I hear the same story, like, oh, my grandpa left me a, you know, a such and such firearm. I can't wait to hunt with this fall. 
make sure it is of that legal caliber to hunt with. So in Colorado, you have to have a 24 caliber rifle uh, in regards to a muzzleloader. Um, you know, for your pronghorn deer, bear, it's going to have to be a 40 caliber. Uh, if you're shooting that inline, if you're shooting a round ball, it has to be larger. For elk and moose in a muzzleloader, it has to be 50 caliber uh, or 54 in regards to, uh, to, to hunting a round ball. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. With archery equipment, you have to be able to pull back a certain poundage. You have to have a broadhead that cuts to a 7 8 inch diameter. There is so much that goes into that, you've got to keep that in priority. Now, all the things that I just stated are right here, page 14 in the Big Game book. So you can download this online. So you don't want to, if you can't get the paper copy, you can go right now. If you just go in and search, you know, the Big Game brochure, it will come up. So make sure it's the 2021, page 14, Legal Methods. It comes in right there. It walks you through all the things I just said. But again, keep that in mind. Uh, I saw a lot of people that, you know, might own a, a 223 and everybody I know talks like, oh, this is going to be a great deer gun. In a lot of states, yes. In Colorado, it's not 24 caliber, so it's not an opportunity that you can use that. So a lot goes into that and you have to make sure you keep that in mind. Now, with the new hunters out there, we've talked to a lot of brand new hunters that are like, where do I start? I, I walked into my local retailer and there are rifles everywhere. What do I use? And honestly, at the end of the day, this is what it comes down to. Being accurate and being very, very comfortable with that firearm. Now, you talk to you know advanced hunters and they're like, I want to be able to shoot out the such and such, and such yardage. It's not about that. When you're starting off, it's about accuracy. So you purchase that firearm, you find that ammunition. I shoot a couple brands of ammunition until I find what my gun really shoots well with. Once I shoot well with that, I work on my skills and I really practice shooting that firearm as often as possible uh, to really dial it in. And a lot of times I kind of shoot two rifles. For me personally, I, I find the hunting rifle that I'm gonna use I shoot it, I dial it, I get comfortable. And a lot of times, since you know ammunition from a different caliber might be easier to find, a lot of times I shoot like a 22. So I keep my shooting skills up with like a 22. Again, just, just learning that optic, learning how to shoot, learning the squeezer or a uh, trigger squeeze, I'm really dialing in my shooting skills with a smaller caliber, but then every so often I'm still shooting that, that rifle round to do that. Once I do that, then I look at distance. I say, okay, you know, I'm very comfortable at 50 yards, let's go out to 100. You know, how's my accuracy at 100? How's my, my bullet and my, my ballistics? Do I have enough energy at 100? If it's 150, if you can look at that. And really, I look at the performance of the rifle, so the ballistic coefficient, as well as my accuracy of the rifle, and that determines how far I shoot. You don't want to be the person who goes, I'm going to buy a 300 wind mag because, like, you know, the guy on TV said it shoots 500 yards. The bullet might be able to do that, but you can't. So, again, you're looking at all of those things. And then also with new hunters, obviously you don't want to get a firearm that has enough energy to where every time you shoot it, you're like, that hurt my shoulder. You know what I mean? You don't want to be scared of the rifle. That's when I say comfortable. You want to make sure it's a firearm. Safety is priority and it should be enjoyable. You never want to be shooting something you're just like, oh, that's awful. Um, you know, and even if you're shooting a larger caliber, there's things like muzzle brakes. But again, you're not going to walk into a gunsmith and say, hey, you know, muzzle brakes, I'm hunting tomorrow. Um, all this stuff takes time. So right now is the time to start looking at all of those steps. Uh, so keep that in mind. So with regards to method of take, those are the key things to think about. We have questions on method of take. I have one question. Okay. Are there options available for me to try out different firearms if I don't have any available to me? Absolutely. Now, obviously, this is going to depend where you're at. We're broadcasting right here in Denver, Colorado, uh, and there is a, a fairly large selection um, of, of firearm you know, companies, shooting ranges, things like that, that offer the availability to rent a firearm to shoot. Now, a lot of your smaller indoor ranges are just going to have handguns. Um, but if you find a range that has an outdoor rifle range or even an indoor rifle range, so when you're searching these places out, look for a rifle range versus a pistol range. If they have a rifle range, call them and say, hey, you know, I I'm a brand new hunter. I'm looking to shoot a rifle. Uh, do you have one for rent? There is actually a fairly long list of, of shooting ranges right here in the Denver metro, especially on the front range that offer you know, firearm rental right there at the place where you can go shoot a variety of calibers. You can shoot a 243 or a .30-06, and you can find out what your comfort level is. Um, and honestly, you can learn a lot about that. You can just say, hey, you know, the length of pull on this firearm is way too much. I'm, I'm awkward shooting it. I, I obviously need a shorter buttstock or anyone that has an adjustable buttstock. 
and things like that. So there is a lot of opportunities. Call around. Um, I know that right now, sometimes on the handgun side, those rentals are hard to come by and the ammunition is hard to come by, but in the long gun version, the hunting rifle version, a lot of those opportunities are there. So talking to a couple of rangers the other day, they welcome that stuff. Uh, so make sure you that give those places a call. They are happy to do so. But keep in mind, in regards to method of take, number one, there's a lot of opportunity by switching methods of take. You can open up an entire world of what's available to you as a hunter. Uh, and also just make sure that you purchase those items now because they're, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of hard to get. So make sure you get that now so you have plenty of time to, to get them, get proficient with them, build up accuracy, and make sure you start shooting more. Now, guys, we're going to wrap up the show here soon. And I promise you, in the coming weeks, we're going to continue this talk. We're going to talk more about gear. We're going to talk about the physical aspects, what you can do on a very small level to get ready for hunting season. Uh, and again, we're going to kind of walk you through what we're seeing as far as regionally, what gear is available, what gear is not available, walk you through optics. So we're going to walk you through all the steps that you need to become a better hunter. Now, as we wrap this up, we talked a lot tonight. We talked about licensing. What is it? April 6th, 8 p.m. Make sure you apply. We talked about scouting. And we can go through and we can kind of break this spreadsheet down for you and walk you through that again. But again, make sure right now it's all about digital scouting. We'll walk you through that process. And then obviously methods of take. Once you know how you're going to hunt this coming fall, now is the time. Make those purchases for those methods of take. Make sure they're legal and get good with them. And that's going to help you, you know, again, achieve a lot more success this coming fall. And always stay tuned. Obviously, we're here on Instagram. We're here on Facebook. We're going to have a lot more content coming in the coming weeks and months, walking you through every bit of this entire process. So stay tuned. And as always, some of you are going to be watching this while we're not live. We're live now, but as we take off the air, still share your comments. That's the biggest thing. We started off with this big sheet of notes right here, uh, and those are all questions. So again, even though we might not be live when we ask your comment, we're going to go back through, we'll answer those questions. Whether we just type a comment or we use it on our next live feed, we will get to all of your questions. So again, if you're watching this, make sure you comment. Also, let us know how we're doing, what you like, what you don't like. It's all about you. I can sit up here and talk about the things that I've done as a hunter, but again, I promise you, it's about you. We want to create success for everyone. Whether you're a brand new hunter or somebody that's been at it a long time, this is all a process. We're walking you through step by step things you can do to create more success hunting big game right here in Colorado. Again, this is the Big Game Hunting Series brought to you by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm your host, Nate Zelensky. We'll see you soon.